also want to mention what Good Friday is. As we come together here tonight, this is a solemn occasion. Because over 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ died on a cross for yours and my sins. And even though that that brought about the very best possible result of yours and my salvation, we gather here today remembering that that was literally and spiritually a dark day. There was darkness when Jesus Christ died for yours and my sins. And it is appropriate on Good Friday for us to not only remember uh, that Jesus died, but to confess and repent of our sins that led Jesus to the cross, to his death. And so one of the things that we're going to do in this service is we're going to be reading through three gospel narratives about the passion narrative or the crucifixion, what led up to it, and then we'll talk about the crucifixion itself. And so our first scripture reading is found on the yellow handout that you found. And I know there aren't the lights aren't on, uh, so it might be hard to see it, but the first reading is from Matthew, Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 through 46, and this is what we are told by the Gospel of Matthew. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, And began to be grieved and distressed. And then he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping And he said to Peter, so you men could not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again a second time and prayed, saying, My father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. Then he came to the disciples. He said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. This is the word of the Lord about Christ leading up to his crucifixion. The story didn't end in the Garden of Gethsemane. The story of Jesus' death continued on from that moment. One of the followers of Jesus, Judas Iscariot, betrayed Jesus, bringing the Romans and the Jewish officials to Jesus where he was praying. They arrested him. The disciples left in fear. And Peter did exactly what Jesus said he would do. He denied Jesus three times before the rooster crowed. The passion narrative picks up in Mark chapter 15. This is to be found on the other side of your yellow handout. Mark chapter 15, verses 1 through 21. The Gospel of Mark tells us, Early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders and scribes and the whole council immediately held a consultation, and binding Jesus, they led him away and delivered him to Pilate. Pilate questioned him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, It is as you say. The chief priest began to accuse him harshly. Then Pilate questioned him again, saying, Do you not answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer, so Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast, he used to release for them any one prisoner whom they requested. The man named Barabbas had been imprisoned with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the insurrection. The crowd went up and began asking him to do as he had been accustomed to do for them. Pilate answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he was aware that the chief priests 
had handed him over because of envy. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to ask him to release Barabbas for them instead. Answering again, Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with him who you call the king of the Jews? And they shouted back, Crucify him! But Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! So wishing to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas for them, and after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers took him away into the palace that is the praetorium, and they called together the whole Roman cohort. They dressed him up in purple, and after twisting a crown of thorns, they put it on him, and they began to acclaim him, Hail, King of the Jews! They kept beating his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling and bowing before him. And after they had mocked him, they took the purple robe off him, put on his own garments on him, and they led him out to crucify him. They pressed into service a passerby coming from the country, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear the cross of Jesus. This is the passion narrative leading up to Jesus Christ's crucifixion. Before we go to prayer, I'm going to do two things. First, we want to be mindful of those who are hurting tonight. Um, my heart is grieved that we have people in our church who are suffering tremendously. That Good Friday is a very difficult day. Uh, some of you might know that the Rapp family is currently in Kansas City because Jody Rapp, uh, daughter of Tracy and GL, was in a pretty significant car accident and has some internal bleeding that they are working on and monitoring right now. Others of you know that Zachary Rhodes is in Columbia because he was coughing up blood earlier today, and so they were monitoring him and seeing what's happening. There are many people in our congregation who need our prayer right now. And on a day like Good Friday, we want to lift up our brothers and sisters in Christ in prayer. We also want to contemplate that Jesus died for our sins. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to give you about a minute, and we're just going to be quiet. You're going to pray, and I'm going to pray. We're going to spend time in silent prayer, and then I will then pray over us. But in this moment, let's lift up our brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's think of that hill on Calvary where our sins were taken away by the blood of Christ. Let's remember and commemorate our Lord and Savior. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are gathered here tonight thinking back to what happened on that dark Friday thousands of years ago. We know that it is historically accurate. Jesus really did die. He died on a cross, on pieces of wood. He died not because he was guilty of any wrongdoing, but he died for the wrongdoing of others. He died for my sins. He died for the sins of those gathered here today. And so, Lord, our hearts are excited for Easter to come in but a few days. Yet, as we gather here, on Good Friday, we have this unique experience of goodness and grief gathered into one. Lord, there's nothing better that could have happened for us that Jesus died to pay the penalty, the punishment, and the removal of the guilt for our sins. And yet, for those of us who have received that forgiveness of sins, through Jesus Christ's death on the cross, 
our hearts are so heavy because we recognize that an innocent one died for us. Jesus, fully God, fully man, died for my sins. But I'm the reason that he died. I'm the reason that he took that abuse. I'm the reason that he was beaten. The reason why he was mocked. And by virtue of my sin, it was as though I was there on that dreadful day putting the nails into his hands and his feet. And every time I sin, I'm putting the nails deeper with a smile on my face. Lord, this is indeed a solemn day when we recognize how egregious our sin is. Father, will you help us to collectively recognize how terrible our sin is and how wonderful our Savior is. How loving you are, God, that though you knew we would be sinners following after our foreparents of Adam and Eve, out of your great love with which you loved us, you sent your Son, Jesus, to die for us. And that Jesus, not only out of obedience, but out of his own volition, he went to the cross, empowered by the Holy Spirit, who gave him strength in the Garden of Gethsemane, as he knew what was about to take place, as he knew what he was about to drink from the cup. He was about to drink the wrath of God over the sins of God's people. Oh, Lord, today is indeed a dark day. But it's also the beginning of the bright realization that our sins are removed. Might we be a people who live in the freedom of the removal and the forgiveness of our sins. And Lord, for those families who are hurting right now, who are in significant situations of hurt and trial and pain, Might they look to the cross. Might they look to the greatest demonstration of God's love upon them through the death and the removal of their sin of the only innocent one to ever live, Jesus Christ. Might we be strengthened by the cross. Might our hope be solely in the cross. And might we live lives of progressive holy sanctification of being conformed more into the image of your son, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins to give us life and hope eternal in himself. Father, it's only for you and only because of you that we have hope. So might we behold that wonderful mystery of our Lord and Savior who died for our sins. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we prepare our hearts to take the Lord's Supper, as we will do here in a little bit, there's one more section of the Passion Narrative to be read. And I hope you have a Bible with you, if you have a phone, a tablet, iPad, or the Bible in the pew in front of you. If you'll pull it out, whatever it might be, to Luke chapter 23 verses 33 through the end of the chapter, which is through verse 49, or close to the end of the chapter. Luke 23, 33 through 49, I'm going to read the conclusion of the Passion narrative leading up to the burial and then subsequent resurrection of Jesus. And I'd like to say a few words about what happened on that dark day. We've heard from Matthew We've heard from Mark. On Sunday, we're going to hear from John. Let us hear from the Gospel of Luke. Luke 23, starting in verse 33. This is what Luke says. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him. 
and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. And the people stood by looking on. And even the rulers were sneering at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if this is indeed the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now there was also an inscription above him which read this, This is the king of the Jews. Of the Jews. Verse 39 One of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, This Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And turning to Jesus, he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly, I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour, and darkness fell upon the whole land until the ninth hour, because the sun was obscured, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had happened, he began praising God, saying, Certainly, this man was innocent. And all the crowds who came together for the spectacle, when they observed what had happened, began to return, beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who accompanied him from Galilee were standing at a distance and we're seeing these things. I want you to imagine something with me very quickly. I want, to imagine, want you to imagine with me the excitement of finally finding your place in life. You've lived a life trying to figure out where you fit in, where your purpose is, and what life is all about, and for the first time, you've seemingly found that. You began to follow a Galilean around. The words that he said were unlike anything you'd ever heard before. When he spoke, it was as one who had authority. His teaching brought affections out of you that you had never known before. And as you followed him, you saw the most amazing things. Not only was he teaching in amazing ways, but you saw him open the eyes of the blind. You saw him heal crippled legs. You saw him cast out demons in crazy people. And you even saw him breathe life into dead people. This man was different in every single way. When he spoke, when he taught, you could barely contain your joy. This man was exactly who you had been hoping to find. He was exactly whom you were created to follow. And when he spoke about a kingdom that was coming, you signed up gleefully, excited that this kingdom was going to be the freedom of oppression from your own sin as well as from the Romans. You were ready to leave the trials, the troubles, and the tribulations of this life behind and give yourself completely to this man. In him, life was going to be better. You'd never been more excited in your life. And then one evening, soldiers came. 
They came, and they came for the one in whom you had hope. As they began to arrest him, you were filled with sheer panic. You remembered for a brief moment and had some respite from your panic that you remembered Jesus said he could command angels at any time. And you thought, surely he's going to demonstrate his power over all of humanity. You even saw one of his disciples cut off an ear of one of the accusers. But Jesus didn't do what you expected and hoped that he would. There were no angels on that night. There was no victory on that night. Jesus stopped Peter. He healed that ear. And instead of fighting back, Jesus went with those who were ignorant to who he was. He didn't try to escape. Instead, he followed them. He was led to a jeering crowd of Roman and Jewish leaders. They accused him of salacious things. Instead of saving himself, he was almost like a lamb. There was no roaring lion to be seen on that day. Instead, he went on trial. He went with Romans. He was beaten. He was abused. He was reviled. He suffered terribly. You saw the man who gave you hope be crushed. You saw him acquainted with grief. You saw him despised. You saw him become a man of sorrow. And all the while, knowing the power of all of eternity was just in his single word, he didn't fight back. He didn't curse his accusers. And he did not revile in return. Not only did you see him beaten and abused, but you watched him on his way to death. On his way to the place of the skull, that's Calvary. You watched that bloody pulp walk past you carrying a heavy piece of wood. But something happened that you did not expect. As you looked at the man who had once given you so much hope, as this man was the Christ, the Messiah, and now you saw him beaten and abused, as he walked by you, you saw in his face a weary determination. You saw the anguish in his soul as though he were carrying a weight far greater than any piece of wood. You couldn't explain it, but in that brief moment as you looked upon his eyes, Somehow you knew that what was about to happen to him should be happening to you. In that moment, you were ke keenly aware that cross, it was meant for you, not for him. The image of death that was about to take place was your image of death that should have happened. You see, friends, these harrowing moments leading up to Jesus' murder and execution, which took place on the cross, we have to rightly understand what happened. We have to understand that Jesus was a real man. He was loved by family. He was loved by friends. There were people there with real dreams who were trusting and believing in him. And on that day, the unthinkable took place. The king, the Christus victor, the one who is going to have victory over all things, died. And he died a humiliating death. He died in such a way that no Roman ever would have died unless that Roman were a traitor. He died on a piece of wood, which the Old Testament says was cursed. He died in the most humiliating way, left up to hang on wood so people walking by would say, wow, what a terrible human. I'm so glad I'm not him. I'm so glad that's not my death. He was humiliated. He was scorned, was betrayed, and he was mocked. Even as he died, the sign above him read mockingly that he was the king of the Jews. 
The Romans, who had no understanding of what they were doing, mocked him as though he were some great ruler who was being killed a shameful death. The centurions, I'm sorry, the Jewish leaders who had been plotting for many, many weeks to kill Jesus were victoriously cheering. And even one of the criminals, as he was dying, also made fun of Jesus as well. Jesus died a humiliating, unkingly-like death. And yet, this death was unlike any other. This death was not meaningless. This death had a purpose. Jesus went of his own volition. He was not forced by the swords of man. He was not forced by the sheer multitude of soldiers around him. Jesus went to the cross. And then on the cross, he said some important things. How unique. When he was on the cross, he died saying these words. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. What kind of a man would die a shameful death saying those words? He asked for a drink, received it, and it was his last. As he was dying, he quoted scripture when he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Quoting from Psalm 22. In that psalm, it's referencing great affliction, literally the piercing of hands and the piercing of feet, and then affirming that God is victorious even in the midst of pain. Though he was mocked by one sinner dying on one side of him, he promised the other sinner that that sinner would join him in paradise that day because that sinner believed in him. As darkness overtook the day, between 12 and 3 o'clock in the afternoon, as Jesus' saving work came to the end, he cried out, it is finished, because the work was coming to an end. His final words, again quoting scripture from Psalm 31, Jesus cried out with his last breath, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. As soon as he breathed his last breath, the earth shook, Rocks split in two, and those who were dead were raised to life so that three days later they would walk into Jerusalem, the holy city, so that people would see something incredible had just taken place in the cross and in the resurrection. Jesus' death was unlike any other. Jesus died with a purpose that no one else has ever ever died with. And it wasn't because of amazing, miraculous things that surrounded Jesus' death. The reason why Jesus' death was so significant is because the purpose of his death was this. Jesus died for the penalty of your sins. Jesus died not because he deserved it, but because we deserved it. The cross was ours. Our name was written into the wood. We should have been there on that day with the cup of God's wrath ready to be poured out for transgressing against the law of God. Our collective disobedience against our creator meant we were to die an eternal death. And yet, A sacrificial lamb came forward. A substitute on your behalf, Christian, came to die so that you and I might have life. One of the most moving moments of the crucifixion happened in Luke 23, which was one of the main reasons I went to Luke. As one criminal hurls abuse from one dying man to another dying man. The other sinner on the other side recognized something miraculous was happening. On that day, the man who was dying in his sin, who asked to be remembered by Jesus when he entered into heaven by trusting and believing that Jesus was innocent, 
Jesus affirmed that man would be in paradise that day with Jesus. Affirming that it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what guilt is upon your soul. It doesn't matter what the past looks like. What matters is who is Jesus to you right now. Friends, we're about to take the Lord's Supper here in a moment. But before we do that, I want to try to drive home the significance of Good Friday. Someone is here in a crowd of this size. Someone is here who doesn't know Jesus Christ. I don't know what has brought you here today. I'm glad that you are here. But you need to hear this if you hear nothing else Hear this great gospel truth that because of what Jesus Christ accomplished on that cross 2,000 years ago as a place of death as he was executed for your sins, then hear this, no matter what you've been, no matter what you've done, you can be saved by trusting and believing alone in the shed blood of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. You can be saved from the greatest burden that has been on your back your entire life. The guilt that has beaten you down, that has accused you, that has said you're not worthy. Friend, I know that. I know that guilt. I know that pain. I know that failure. But friends, the answer is not you getting better. It's not you finally getting your life on track. It's not about being a better person. It's looking to a bloody cross where your sins were removed by the grace of God. It doesn't matter what you've done. It matters who you're believing in today. Believe in Jesus and your sins are forgiven. Trust in him. You are made into a new creation. Place your faith in Jesus Christ and you are right with God. It can happen. And what better day than today, Good Friday, the day of your awakening to Jesus Christ. If that's one group that's here, there's another group that's here. That group is about to take the Lord's Supper. Those who have received so great a forgiveness by that blood of the Lamb who died for our sins. Friend, we are going to celebrate on Resurrection Sunday in but three days, but right now we need to mourn. The celebration will come as Jesus defeats sin and death in the resurrection. But as we look to the cross, if you are in Christ and your sins have been forgiven, then friends, on a day like today, mourn your sin that sent your Savior to the cross and commit to living a holy life from this point on. How appropriate. Our sins that sent Jesus to die on a cross, very similar as that, For us to say, Lord, I'm not worthy. Forgive me of what I have done and help me to live for your glory from here on out. There were two men who died for their sins that day on the cross on either side of Jesus. Which one are you, friends? Are you the one that just wanted what Jesus could give him? Save yourself and save us. Or are you the one that says, Jesus, you are innocent. I am not. My death is a just death. Yours is not. It's only through Jesus Christ that I have any hope. Which one are you today? We're going to take a few moments and we're going to take the Lord's Supper here together. As you pull out what has been given to you,
And if you do not have this, please raise your hand. And as our deacons come forward, they will make sure to give you the Lord's Supper. We need to prepare our hearts for what we're doing here this evening. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, leading up to the passion narrative of what was already read to us earlier today, earlier this evening, Jesus shared one last final meal with the disciples. The reason why he did this was he was looking back to the, to the Passover. And in the Passover, where a lamb's blood was painted on the doorpost to give life in the midst of death to Israel, so Jesus was about to be that sacrifice lamb for our sins. Jesus said, knowing what he was about to do on the cross, Jesus said, eat the bread and remember my body broken for your sins. He took the cup and he said, drink this in remembrance of my blood poured out to remove your sins. And he said, to be my follower, do this regularly, remembering, celebrating the death of Jesus Christ. So friends, there's no salvation in eating and drinking what you're holding in your hands. God is not more pleased with you just because you drink this or eat this. God cares about your heart. He cares about your heart's posture to him. This is a representative of the one who died on that. As we prepare to eat and drink, it's appropriate for us to confess our sins to the Lord. It is appropriate for us to mourn our sins that put Jesus on that cross. It's appropriate to thank the Lord in Christ that our sins have been removed because of his death. And it's right to commit today, Lord, no more will I live in sin. No more will I excuse my sin. I will trust and believe and have faith and live according to your law. Friends, if you're here today and you're trusting in Jesus Christ, you have been saved, you have been baptized in your salvation, and you're in good standing with this church or another Bible-believing and preaching church, then we welcome you to take communion with us to celebrate the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper. If you're here this evening, and for whatever reason, whatever has brought you here, you're not right with the Lord. The weight of your sin is still upon you. Don't partake of this. Don't be worried about what your neighbor thinks because in 2 Corinthians it says, those who eat and drink of the Lord's Supper without the confession of sins and who do so with a wrong heart eat and drink judgment upon themselves. If you're, in, if you're not in Christ, we're thankful that you're here, but it would be better for you to not partake in this Last Supper. So as our deacons come, we're first going to pray. And Bill, you're going to pray over this bread that we're about to eat, this cracker that we're about to eat, remembering that it signifies the body of Christ that was put to death for us. He's going to pray, and then we're going to take this together. Bill, would you give us about a minute for us all to confess our sin, and then will you lead us in prayer as we prepare to remember the body of Christ broken for our sins? Father, we are in awe of what Jesus did for us. We remember this evening his perfect body, sinless, that was broken, the sacrificial lamb that willingly gave of himself and crawled upon the cross. Nobody took his life. He gave it willingly for the forgiveness of sins of me and everyone who's, who accepts him. Father, if I would have been only one who needed his sacrifice, he still would have taken all of my sin upon his shoulders and carried it to the cross. For he prayed in the garden, not his will, but your will be done. Lord, as we remember tonight, we do indeed mourn as we are witness to, to what happened so many years ago on that cross, and, and we are the benefactors of, of that sacrifice, that perfect sacrificial lamb. Lord, we thank you this evening. We celebrate, we mourn, and we give praise to the only one who is worthy. 
It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. If you'll take the cracker out of its containment. We read from Luke chapter 23, but the chapter just before is in Luke 22. We read about this last supper that Jesus had with his disciples. And this is what Jesus says in verse 14 of Luke 22. When the hour had come, Jesus reclined at the table and the apostles with him. Jesus said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it has been fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on till the kingdom of God returns. And in verse 19, and when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it, he gave it to them, and he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this or eat this in remembrance of me. Let us eat, remembering praising and celebrating the body of Christ, crushed and beaten for our sins and the removal of our sins. Jesus didn't finish with the bread. He then knew that his blood was going to be poured out for the sins of his people. And so when he took the cup, He told them to remember as they drank, remembering the blood of Jesus Christ that was poured out over our sins. Bill, will you lead us in prayer and once again, give us about a minute. Not only are we confessing our sin to the Lord, but we are thanking and praising him that no longer in Christ are those sins identifying us, but in Christ our sins are removed as far as the east is from the west because of the blood of Christ The red blood of Christ has made us as white as snow, all because of the blood of Christ. Let's go to the Lord, praising him for his blood that has washed us and made us whole. Father, thank you for giving us this Lord's Supper celebration. It causes to weep and rejoice at the same moment. Thank you for allowing and for Jesus voluntarily shedding his blood for us. And like Pastor Jeremiah mentioned, the red blood washes the sins away to become white as snow. May we drink this cup and call to mind the great forgiveness, the great grace, the greatness of your sacrifice we can never pay back or rightly thank you for. Thank you for your love. Amen. Amen. If you will remove carefully the lid to the juice. After giving of the bread in remembrance of his body, in verse 20 of Luke, again 22, we're told, and in the same way, Jesus took the cup, and after they had eaten of the bread, he said this, this cup, which is poured out for you is the new covenant and my blood. Let us drink in remembrance of the blood that has washed away all of our sins and made us new in him. If you will return each of your Lord's Supper cup and the the lids inside of your baggie and we'll have places to throw those away as you exit and leave. Friends, Good Friday is a difficult time. It's a good time. It's a difficult time. We're going to celebrate on Easter. 
We're going to celebrate on Resurrection Sunday. Would you come back on Sunday morning? We're going to have service at 8.15. We have Sunday school at 9.30. And again, for the children, there will be candy. Because yes, we are wanting to give children candy as much as we're able. And then we have the second final service at 10.45. Would you come and be a part of the celebration? Because it didn't end on the cross. The removal of our sins ended, but death's defeat took place in the resurrection. The certainty of yours and my eternity was completed and sealed when Jesus Christ was no longer dead. But when he was alive, that gave you and me new life as well. Won't you come back on Easter Sunday as we celebrate what Jesus has done? We're going to have a closing song, and then I'm going to come back up, and I'm going to close us in prayer. And we're going to do something really special at the very end to just make sure that we not only have been Solomon here, but that we take this home remembering the blood and the body of Christ that was killed for us. So, friends, what we're going to do is we're going to close in prayer. And when I conclude in the prayer, if you'd like to, you can get up and you can leave. If you'd like to stay and keep praying, you can stay and keep praying. It'll be up to you when you'd like to leave. Here's what we ask of you. As you leave, don't forget what's just taken place here. It would be inappropriate for us to be solemnly remembering on this day in the sanctuary what Christ has done and then to go out and just slap each other on the back as though nothing has taken place. It's right, appropriate, and good for us to close in prayer and then on your own to pray as the Lord leads you. When you're ready, you may get up, you might go home, thank the Lord for the removal of your sins and come back and celebrate on Easter Sunday. Let me close us in prayer and the Lord leads you as you pray as well. Father, we are indeed thankful We are thankful for your goodness from eternity past that in your plans and in your purposes and in your desiring that you sent your son to come to this earth to be born of a virgin, to grow in strength and all wisdom, to live perfectly, to for multiple years teach and proclaim the gospel of repentance of the new kingdom that was coming, to inaugurate the new covenant and then to seal it with your blood as Jesus, you died on the cross for our sins. God the Father, you planned this. Jesus Christ the Son, you accomplished this. And God and the Holy Spirit You worked through all of this to bring it about so that we might respond in receiving so great a salvation. Father, as we go from this place, might your hand of grace be upon us. Might we never get over the cross. And might we celebrate not just a good Easter day, but might we celebrate Resurrection Sunday that death has been defeated, life is given freely, and in Jesus Christ, we are promised life eternal if we believe and trust and follow him. Lord, might your hand of grace be upon us. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the blood. And thank you for the forgiveness of your sins. We pray this in the perfect, sacrificed, crucified, and resurrected name of Jesus Christ. Amen.